Hello, my name is Anna and I love trying vintage recipes. And back when I first started my channel, I made a promise. Ring around tuna salad. I'm not ready for a gelatin mold that is savory. I just can't right now. <laughs> if I ever reach 10,000 subscribers, I will make the ring around tuna salad mold. <laughs> Let's make a ring around tuna salad. Thank you so much if you have ever watched any of my videos. If you like them, if you don't like them. <laughs> Either way, if you've watched one, if you've subscribed, if you've commented, that has all helped me get here and helped me get to this recipe that I wasn't sure I would ever have to make. Oh dear. This recipe has a few things that I'm not excited about. I like tuna. I like it. It also contains crunchy onions and yes, celery. <laughs> I'm gonna try to have as much fun as possible and I hope you enjoy. Soften gelatin in cold water. I don't make a lot of gelatin molds. I've made one on this channel, but luckily it does give the instructions on how to dissolve gelatin properly for this mold. So that is what I'm following. I just have unflavored gelatin. I don't buy the envelopes most of the time just because I like to have it for other things. And that way if I mess up, <laughs> I have more. So I'm gonna stir that up. That was a fourth of a cup of cold water as directed in the recipe. And now I'm supposed to take a pan, it just as a small pan of hot water. This is not boiling water, this is, this is just hot water. It says I have to place this in this hot water for 10 minutes. So while that's sitting in the hot water, I'm gonna prep my gelatin mold. This recipe requires a one and a half quart, that's six cups gelatin mold, and I do happen to have one. For my first gelatin molds, I did brush the mold in just a little bit of oil, and I got those instructions by watching a few YouTube videos on gelatin molds specifically. You know, people who make them regularly. I'm gonna oil this, but then also when I'm ready to unmold the gelatin mold tomorrow, I'll dip this in a little bit of warm water just to let that release. If I had had one of those fish shaped like copper gelatin molds, I think that would have been great, but working with what I have. Also, this is called a ring around tuna mold and it, you know, this is a ring, so. But I think, I think it's supposed to be like ringing of a telephone, ring around. I'm gonna be using my glass KitchenAid mixer bowl, mostly because it is plenty large enough and it has a pour spout and a handle. So I'm hoping that it will be easy to pour this into the mold. You know, maybe it'll just make things a little easier for me. The star of the show. This is from a carnation milk cookbook, so this is my carnation milk. Slowly add carnation to mayonnaise in a large bowl, stirring constantly. So I got out my good old twist whisk and I'm just gonna whisk these things together. A cup of mayonnaise. And I am using Hellman's. So usually for salads, I will use Hellman's. For sandwiches, we'll use Duke's if we have it. Here in Ohio, it's pretty easy to find nowadays. We are a dual mayonnaise household. <laughs> so this is a cup of carnation, evaporated milk, add lemon juice, salt, and dissolved gelatin. That is a quarter cup of lemon juice, a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. I kind of think this would taste good on its own, like as a salad dressing. That is my dissolved gelatin. Fold in remaining ingredients. And oh, what ingredients they are. <laughs> One fourth of a cup of chopped onion. That's, I'm supposed to fold. I'm supposed to fold. We're gonna put this in the sink. A cup of canned tuna that has been drained. All right, we got the tuna. Big moment. Half a cup of finely chopped celery. <laughs> Never thought I'd see the day. <laughs> I'm not really a huge celery fan if you're new here. If you're new here, this is such a weird video to start with. Um, maybe go watch some of my other ones. <laughs> oh no. Two tablespoons of chopped pimentos. And then half a cup of sliced ripe olives or black olives. This is what we're looking at. It's, you can kind of see it through the bowl, but it's got a lot of, lot of business happening in there. I wanna make sure I have this piece on. This is like a three piece mold. So this part actually comes apart, which is nice. Just in case, I am gonna put this on a bowl, you know, extra protection because this is gonna sit in my refrigerator overnight. Not something I am used to doing. We gotta rotate, we gotta rotate. Didn't quite fill, but I, it's probably fine. I mean, I'm, this is pretty low stakes. I'm not like serving this to anybody but myself. I'm gonna do just a little cleanup here. 
put the lid on top and I'm gonna put this in my refrigerator overnight. We'll see what the results look like tomorrow. While my ring around tuna salad is quite literally chilling in the fridge, I thought I would answer some frequently asked questions that usually pop up in my comments. So the number one question I get, where did you get your apron? I wear three different aprons typically in my videos. I do have one holiday apron and I did get a new apron for the fall that I cannot wait to show you. But usually people are asking about this one, this lovely sort of green retro pear and apple design. This is from a collection that Orla Kylie did for Target back in I think 2008. Orla Kylie is a designer and her textiles are usually this like repeating leaf pattern or you know something like this. I actually have a collection of bedding she did years ago in our guest room that's like the leaf pattern. You might think it seems a little familiar. But anyway, because this was produced back in I think 2008, you can't just go buy one in a store. They do sometimes pop up on eBay and Etsy. I bought this like when it was first produced and I had no idea that people were sort of collecting these things. If you happen to across one of these in a thrift store, like snap it up, snap it up. I'm not joking. Second, this is a new edition, but this green one, I think the color is called like broccolini or something. So this is my newest edition. This is a Headley and Bennett smock style apron. And I've wanted one of these for so, so long. I got this as a gift for my husband as a surprise for reaching 2000 subscribers. That was a little while ago. These are similar or the same ones that Claire Saffitz wears. And I love the smock style. Fits really well. It's very comfortable to wear. It has pockets. The quality is amazing. The stitching on the straps makes it like extra extra strong. The fabric is really nice. I'm a kind of a fabric person. I actually bought a knockoff version of one of these on Amazon once and it, it shrank. It like it did not hold up. So a little bit pricey, definitely an investment, but I think the quality is incredible and I think it's totally worth it if you kind of are considering one of these. And then the third apron, and I believe this is the apron I wore in my earlier videos is this one. And I got this at a thrift store uh, in 2000, so a long time ago, for a nickel, okay? <laughs> I bought this for my fiber arts class that I took in college. We needed an apron. Somehow I did not damage it and thank goodness because I don't think I can replace this one. I don't wear it as much anymore, mostly because of this. You can hear that when I'm filming because I clip my mic to it. So I'm thinking that maybe if I put some rubber bands there or something, it won't do that. How old are you? I'm 42. What is that thing in the bottom of your oven? <laughs> The thing in the bottom of my oven is a well-loved, well-used pizza stone. I like making homemade pizza. With a pizza stone, you're not supposed to expose it to like extreme temperatures right away. When you wanna use one, you put it in your oven and you preheat your oven like at the same time. So, you know, you don't preheat your oven and then put the stone in. You put the stone in first and then bring it up to temperature with your oven. And it's the same thing when you're done using the stone. You don't wanna take it out and like expose it to like an extreme temperature change. So you're supposed to let it cool down with your oven. And what typically happens for me, and I suspect I am not alone in this, I forget about it. <laughs> So I let it cool down with my oven and it just kind of lives in there most of the time, which is fine. Some people say it actually makes the temperature of your oven a little bit more consistent. So it's not hurting anything in there. What is my definition of vintage? This is a hot topic, folks. <laughs> there are a few different ones that people follow. I've seen definitions range from at least 20 years old to at least 40 years old. Antique is supposed to mean 100 years or older. Me personally, I like to cook from cookbooks that are older than I am for the most part. Part, which makes me a vintage person and I am so okay with that. I know some people were like, I only consider, you know, this age pre-1950 to be vintage. I guess you can kind of follow whichever definition you want, but me personally, I cook from cookbooks that are 40 years or older. What cookbooks do you look for? I don't always have a specific cookbook that I'm looking for. Occasionally I do, but really it's just about what appeals to me while I'm looking. I love a colorful cookbook. I love cookbooks with illustrations. I, it doesn't always have to have that though. Some of my favorites, I mean, I love Betty Crocker cookbooks. I love Better Homes and Gardens cookbooks. And I really love little product booklets. Those are so much fun because, and I've said this before, the product booklets are, you know, they're made to promote a specific product. So a lot of times you get a booklet full of interesting recipes where they try to use like one product in all of them. And it, it's just a lot of fun. It's not like I automatically scoop up all cookbooks from a certain era. It's just kind of like what strikes my fancy at the time. Why don't you do 
XYZ to the recipe you're cooking. I've tried to say this a little bit more in my videos, especially since I've had more new viewers. I try to cook the recipes from my vintage cookbooks as closely as I can to the original. I don't get there 100% of the time because some ingredients like aren't available in the same form or, you know, I don't grind my own flour. I'm not doing that. I love all of you, but that's just not something that I'm willing to do. There are certain things that I'm just like, I'm just gonna use the modern ingredients that are available to me but I don't tend to alter like spice too much or, you know, I try to replicate whatever it says in the cookbook and then, you know, I'll taste it and I might give a couple of comments on what I personally would have done in the recipe. What does in the wild mean? I think there are a lot of other people who thrift that like to use this term. What if I'm looking for Bitty Crocker's cookie book? I could go to Etsy or eBay and just do a search for this and get it. You know, I would probably find several copies and I could just purchase it. But if I want to find this in the wild, that means I want to go out and I want it to be kind of like kismet. Oh my gosh, I was at a thrift store. Look what I found. I'm so excited. It is a surprise. It is a delight. And that's what I mean by in the wild. And that is a lot of times like my preferred method of shopping for cookbooks. I, I like to do it that way. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with searching for something on eBay or Etsy. I got my Betty Crocker recipe card library, my green one. I got that by searching on eBay. Certain things I will do that. I will like specifically search for them, but vast majority of my finds are like in the wild finds. This one's not so much a question, but I do want to talk about Dottie. <sighs> Unfortunately, we had to say goodbye to Dottie about a year ago. And if this is like too hard for y'all to listen to, uh, if you just want to like skip to this timestamp just to get through this part, it's like not that easy for me to talk about either. When we had to say goodbye to her, I didn't even have a thousand subscribers yet. So there's no way for you guys to know that this happened. Um, she's in a lot of my older videos, but we had her for 16 years and she was a huge part of our life and we loved her very much. We had her when she was a little puppy. We moved with her four times, I think. Like she lived in Chicago with us. She lived in California with us for the last year of her life. Unfortunately, as she aged, like she was very spry for a very long time, but she started having seizures. And I did talk about that in a video and her health was just, declining and declining and we were doing everything we could because we wanted to keep her with us for as long as possible. Like I know we had her for 16 years. It wasn't long enough. I know that sounds selfish. It's just never, <laughs> it's never long enough. So shortly before we moved from California back to Ohio, her health was declining so much. She could not rest. She was constantly pacing all day, all night. Like she just it, there was nothing else we could do. We we had wonderful vets out in California. I love them. Like I cannot recommend them enough. <laughs> I'll even link the website in the description down below. They were great, but there was just, there was nothing else we could do. And we were trying and we were trying to keep her with us. We had to make that decision. It was the worst day of my life. Um, and if you've lost a pet, you know, you understand, but Let's try to get, let's try to get this a little more positive. I'm so happy that I have all of that footage of her, that she was appearing in my videos and that some of you have gotten to see her. Okay, sorry, I needed a minute. So if you see her in my early videos and you leave a comment about how wonderful she is, how cute she is, like, thank you so much. But I just want to let you know, like that's that's why you don't see her anymore. But I'm gonna move on. We're gonna look we're gonna look at another question. This is kind of a funny one. And I've gotten this so many times, so many times in the last like six weeks or so. Did you know that Betty Crocker isn't real? <laughs> yes. Yes, I know Betty Crocker is not real. And I actually talked about this. I didn't realize I had to rewatch my um, original Carnation Milk Teen Time Cooking video for this video. I didn't realize, I actually talked about how I knew that Betty Crocker was not a real person. So yeah, Betty Crocker, I like to think of her as Santa Claus, kind of, like in the same vein. Sometimes when I'm making a Betty Crocker recipe, I like to talk about Betty as though she was a real person, but I'm fully aware she was not a real woman. She had many portraits throughout the years. And those types of figureheads were really popular at one time. You may have heard of Anne Pillsbury, but maybe not because Anne Pillsbury, also not a real woman, she did not make it. <laughs> she did not stick around for as long as Betty Crocker did. Duncan Hines though, Duncan Hines was a real person and this is what he he looked like. <laughs> yes, I know, Betty, not real, but I like to think that her spirit kind of was like with people as they learn to cook or as they use a Betty Crocker cookbook. 
And also, sorry, I, I don't mean to stick with this. Thank you to the people who have asked this question of me kindly or have sort of gently tried to tell me that Betty Crocker is not real. I really appreciate that because there have been several <laughs> that have been more like, you're dumb, she's not real. No, no, I, I know. I have an entire Betty Crocker cookbook shelf, so yeah. <laughs> How many cookbooks do you have? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not great at tracking this stuff. I really, I'm terrible. All of my cookbooks come in like different sizes and shapes and like booklets and full on like volumes and all kinds of stuff. I've thought about trying to catalog these and I've had people ask like, would I be willing to put out a full list? Maybe, like it's gonna take me some time. I don't really even know how I would wanna go about that and like go about sharing it with everyone. For a while when my collection was a little bit smaller, it was really easy for me to remember. Oh yeah, I have that one, I have that one. I'm still pretty decent. I don't buy that many doubles, but I, I honestly, I could not tell you. I, I just don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one more. What kind of camera do you use? I film pretty much all of my videos on a Sony ZV-1. The main parts of my videos are on a Sony ZV-1 typically. And then like for my B cam footage, if I'm like doing two different types of shots of the same thing, I just use my phone for that. This ZV-1 is a very popular vlogging camera. Simple to use, it's lightweight. I'm not like trying to sell you on this camera. I'm not really a camera person. My husband actually bought me bought me this camera. I'll just kind of tell you the story of how my channel even came about. I was joking about I should have this channel where I cook for my vintage cookbooks offhand comment. Next thing I know, he's ordered a <laughs> this camera for me and is like, I got you this camera. You better learn how to use it. So that's what happened. I mean, I, I really didn't plan on doing this, but then the more I did it, the more I enjoyed it. I kind of started from zero. I didn't know how to use the camera. I didn't know how to edit a video. I didn't know how to structure a video, really. And that stuff just comes with time and practice. And I was interested enough in learning and like curious enough about how things worked that that's like how I figured it out. The hardest thing about having a YouTube channel, to me, this is my opinion, it's not the filming, it's not the editing necessarily. Those things can be difficult, they are hard, but you can learn. The hardest part's getting started, making that first video, making the first several videos. And then to me personally, the very hardest part of doing this is creating something and showing it to other people because you really do open yourself up for what people think about it, what people think about you. There's this saying, I'm sure you've heard it before, but it's something like you could be the ripest, juiciest peach and there will still be people who hate peaches. I'm not for everyone and I have to be okay with that. I'm getting more okay with it. The vast majority of you have been so nice and so kind in the comments. One of the best outcomes that I've gotten from starting a YouTube channel is that people are sharing their personal stories and telling me this recipe brought back memories. I ate this as a kid. My grandma made this. My family had this at the holidays. I love hearing that. I actually take my favorite comments and I screenshot them, put them in a folder. And when I'm having a hard time, I'll just read a few just to make myself feel a little bit better. You all taking the time to watch my videos and engage with them, that means the world to me. It really, really does. She is solid. <laughs> I purposely left this in the fridge overnight because I was a little worried that like it wouldn't set up otherwise. I checked it after dinner and I needn't have worried because it was like in this particular very, I don't know if I can convey how solid this is, state, it's just within a few hours. Do you have this bowl of warm water? Just to dip it in so that it can like maybe help it release. Let me, let me figure this out. What, what order would I like to do this in? I have a little kitchen towel and then I have a really beautiful platter. Let's give this a shot. <laughs> okay, one cool thing about this is that you can see, you can see through it and I can see that this is not releasing yet. Oh wait, could I take this off? <gasps> I don't think you could hear it. Oh, I wish you could have, but it did. <gasps> oh my gosh, look. Oh, we're coming up there. Oh, I should have put this on a colorful platter. Can you even see it? We, we may need to transfer this, please hold. Better, now we're talking. Pink plate, very festive. 
Okay, so I have a couple of things to say before I try this. This is just kind of like out of my wheelhouse. It is a little out of character for me. Even the tuna salad itself, if it wasn't gelatinous in nature, is not one that I would normally choose. I like my tuna salad pretty plain. I don't like a lot of extra crunchy things. If you've watched me for a little while, you know. Yeah, there's like a lot of uh, challenging things in this for me, but that's okay. I promised I would make it and I did. Just because I feel that way, if you make this recipe and you like this recipe, like keep on making it. Do it if it makes you happy. It is your thing. You can own that. But for me, like this is this is just like not what I'm usually used to. Anyway, enough stalling. We're gonna cut into this baby. <laughs> I don't know if you can see my cut there, but it brought a little little couple goodies with it. I'm just gonna go real small. Oh, oh no. Oh. It, it's still very solid, so that went well. Before I dig in, I just wanted to give you a little, little bit of a cross section of what it looks like on the plate. Also, this very cute plate, it came from the Dollar Tree. Oh, the big taste. I'm just, I gotta just go in. You know, I'm gonna like aim for this olive because I like olives and I want a little something that I know I'm gonna like out of this. But I will make sure that I also have a celery. There's a celery there. Okay, not the worst. It kind of melts a little bit in your mouth. It's not like so gelatinous, but I gotta say that tuna salad rather bland. So if I had to do this, like I, I honestly don't mind like the jello part of it too much, but the tuna salad, it tastes a lot of lemon. So I think to balance it, that acid out, needs a little salt maybe, and like maybe a little onion powder. I think onion powder would probably lend a little bit more flavor than those crunchy onions. I'm gonna take another bite because I am a brave, woman. Oh, you know what? And I didn't even get a pimento the first time. So that was a big mistake. We're going to do it again. That was a much crunchier bite. I've taken two bites. The second bite, I'm adjusting to it. I liked it a little better, the tuna salad nature of it. I still think it needs a little bit of salt. There's a little bit of salt in here, but I think it could just use a little bit more, but really it's not as, it's not quite as scary. It's not quite as scary. Truly, if you took the crunchiest parts out and you seasoned it up a little bit better, I could see this kind of almost being like um, some sort of spread for crackers. Like you just kind of dig your crackers into it, like get your Ritz or your club or whatever, your saltine and eat it that way. Will I make it again? Probably not. Still, I, I don't think I'll make it again, but you know what? I am glad I gave it a shot. I would be willing to try some more Jello molds, probably sweet ones. I will say it is so satisfying when that jello mold like releases onto the plate. So I did it. I kept my promise because you all helped me get to 10,000 subscribers. I wouldn't be here without you. And I so appreciate the time that you take to watch my videos, to engage with them, to to leave me comments. I had a lot of fun making these videos, like whatever size my audience, but I'm just so glad that some of you are entertained by them. Some of you are actually soothed by them. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's all I can really say. And I will do my darndest to keep making videos that you enjoy. I hope you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thanks again. And I will see you in my next video. Bye.